Indeed, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I trust that you had a lovely restorative weekend. And of course, you're bullish about this particular week that the good Lord has afforded us. My name is Dibala Nair. And of course, we have a lot lined up for you today on This Is A Point, where we take a look at the politics of the week that has been. And of course, we have a lot to discuss today. Before we drill deeper, we start with the dailies. And this is what is headlining the front page of the Daily Nation this morning. Paradise ruined. Since the infamy of 2007, tourists have given Kenya wide berth and locals have paid the price. High responsible politics and threat of terrorism are strangling tourism. You have the story well fleshed out for you on page 2 and 3 of the Daily Nation today. And we can see also part of what remains of the once acclaimed Sinbad Hotel in Malindi after a string of bad luck over the years. Many hotels at the cost of facing a similar fate in the wake of dwindling tourist numbers. But... A few are reinventing themselves and staying afloat by the straps of their boots. And of course, you can see that picture, a related picture of a story on the front page of the Daily Nation today. Ruto to NASA, stop all your power games, work with us, he says. And this story continues on page four of the Daily Nation this morning. Also, teachers flew or flee, I should say, were after Shabab attack. We'll give you all the gritty details in our bulletin this morning and detained Kenyan pilots to be freed after redress deal. This on page 8 of the Daily Nation this morning as well. We have a standard, and this is a splash today. No end to NASA. Wars over post? This is all about dispute. A plot to swap the names of Senate Minority Whip Mutula Kilonzo of Waipa and Viga Senator George Haniri of the Mani National Congress to end stalemate over Parliamentary Service Commission seats open up a new war front. You have this story tucked away on page 7 of the standard this morning. And you can see also court to Secretary General Francis Atwoli flanked by Mani National Congress party leaders and Western region elders addressing the press at his home in Ebuhuala village in Huisero yesterday. You can follow that story inside the standard today and also Ruto. Ruto's message for or to the rift for 2022. Deputy President William Ruto fights back as rebellion mounts in his backyard, cautions leaders from region against washing, washing their dirty linen in public, solicits for help from locals in dealing with what he sees as errant leaders distracting him. You have this story all fleshed out on page uh, inside the Daily, inside the Standard today on page six. Also, Auditor General to Kenna wasted 6.4 billion shillings. He said, Ken, Kenha wasted. 6.4 billion shillings. That is in the standard. The star is up next. Miguna takes on D and Magaya in Nasa Wrangles. It says national resistance movement has been associated with Miguna while Lee has been leading the People's Assembly Coordinating uh, Committee. You have the story continuing on page four and five of the star. Katera spends third night in cells as CBK probes T bills. Is another story that you want to follow inside the star on page six and tax collector irregularly awarded 4.6 billion shillings at tender. This is what the Auditor General is saying, and that story continues on page 14 of the star this morning. Qu a quick look now at the people daily. Ditch NASA or the MMPs tell Ryla Beta MP Milio Diambo leads legislators demanding party leaders exit from alliance to strengthen the Orange Party ahead of 22. 2022 polls and that story continues on page six of the people daily this morning as western drift leaders uh back ruto for 2022 it says as western rift leaders back ruto for 2022 this story continues on page four of the people daily this morning i want to show you also what we have on the front page of uh, taifa leo before i head there i can show you also the business daily as well consumers hit as plastic bags trade goes secret Trade in the banned product is booming thanks to importation from neighboring countries. You can follow that story also on page four of the Business Daily. Also, Kenjen signs fresh deal to upgrade Masinga Dam wall. Investor gets 27 million shillings award for Safari Comapio refunds delay. And also looking at the seeker, Uhuru Ruto spends 193 million shillings on local travels alone that story you have it on page six of the people of the business daily this morning i want to show you also what we have on the front page of the the citizen in tanzania gainers losers in battle of telecom com companies all mobile telecommunications fans operating in tanzania with the exception of two experienced growth in voice subscribers Last year, according to latest statistics released by the regulator, you can follow this story on page two of the citizen in Tanzania as well. And also, CCM retakes Kinondoni Siha from opposition. 
This on page two of The Citizen. And John Pombe Mag Magufuli, oldest proba after students shot dead by police on page three of The Citizen. 91 days missing. Bring back Azuri, the journalist who's still missing. Almost now, only nine days shy to 100 days. And still the hashtag is on. They're looking out for Azuri, the journalist who's missing. And this is in Tanzania. Still in Tanzania, we have Mwana Inchi. And this is your splash today. Kifo cha Mwanafunzi Chagusa Kila Kona. That is what we have as a splash today on the front page of Mwana Inchi. You can follow that story. Wabunge, Wateule, Watamba, Chadema, Haitambui, Matokeo. That is a story that you want to follow also inside the People Daily as well. Allow me to show you quickly what we do have also inside the New Times in Rwanda. IMF speaks out on Rwanda's debt levels. All right, that is a splash on the front page of the New Times. If you're waking up in Rwanda, you can follow that story as well. And Rwanda maintains tough stance or tough stance on used clothes. That story continues. It continues on page 18 of the New Times in Rwanda. The East African this week. East Africa banks on. Ramaphosa, as Ethiopia six leader, is all about succession. Questions of who will become the next or next prime minister is not as important as how genuine the ruling party is to lead country to democracy, it says, and also doing business. Optimism in the region that is keep that is keen, I should say, to attract investment from Africa's second largest economy. If there are decades in which nothing happens, this will go down as a week in which decades happen. In less than 17 hours, the heads of two of Africa's most powerful nations resigned amid party pressure. That is what we can follow on the page 6, 8, 9, 10, 16 and 17 of the East African this week. Buying out disgracefully, you have the faces there forced out. Alimarim Desaleng resigned amid powerful pressure from the party and also military takeover. Robert, Robert Mugabe, the Zimbabwean strong man, forced to quit after 37 years. That is a story on this week's The East African. Also, you can try and uh, see how Japan is deepening its soft power in Africa and Kenya imports $31.2 million maize from the region. Countries yet to recover from last year's drought, warm invasion. That is what we have on the front page of The East African this week. A quick look at the editorial cartoons, if you may. And that is what we have inside the standard today. According to Castle, right, a ticking time bomb there is a, this is uh, terrorism. Uh, this is what now has been captured by Castle inside the standard. Also, let's see what we have inside the Daily Nation today, according to Igar. Uh, this is what he's drawn for us today. Free day, secondary education. Of course, this is what is saddling a student right now. Overstretched facilities, teacher uh, shortage, congestion, overwhelming demand, and no fans. Uh, blah, blah, blah. It continues. And also, we want to see what we have inside the star, according to uh, Victor. That is on page two of a star. Ouch! Ethiopia. This is how it is right now. But of course, you can see the symbol of resistance or revolution there. And that is the government stepping down on civil liberties. And of course, uh, uh, we can see how also opposition leaders have been treated. And this is what has been captured by Victor. Victor inside the star. I want to show you lastly what we do have inside the People Daily today. According to Stano, sciences, our subjects, right? The boys are doing well. Believe in yourself, you can do it. And this is how it is. You can actually see the rest, which is ongoing, where the boys are actually leading in the sciences and the subjects. Uh, well, the girl child seem to be stranded a bit. And I want to show you lastly what we what we have also as today's picture of the day hacking you back to some years back if you may and you can see that is a picture of the day if you may, you may remember that man there that is Tom Mboya Tom Boyer that is the Kenya's Minister for Economic Development and Planning Mr. Tom Boyer saying farewell to President Joseph Mobutu Mobutu Seseko of the Congo also known as Zaire then, Dr. Odir Congo and DRC in 1966. And of course in the center is the Minister for Defense, Dr. Njoroge Mungai. That's from our archives there, courtesy of the library. That is from Maria 
Kanini of the Daily Nation. So those are your dailies today. Paradise ruined. That is a splash on the front page, of course, of the Daily Nation today. Thank you very much. You can grab a copy of the Daily Nation. Thank you. Also, you can grab a copy of the Standard, the Style, whichever paper that really floats you. But for now, let's put this horse into full run as always by looking at the highlights. Kupet calls for withdrawal of teachers from northeastern amid rising insecurity. Their leaders say Vasali Madavadi still calls the short or shorts in Western. Ethiopia says state of emergency will last six months. And South African president under pressure to reshuffle cabinet. The Kenya Union of Post Primary Education Teachers that is Kupet wants the Teachers Service Commission to withdraw teachers from the northern part of Kenya until the security is guaranteed. The Union Secretary General Akelo Misori says the students can be accommodated in the nearby schools in the meantime. We demand that the Teachers Service Commission withdraw the teachers in affected areas until those areas are safe for teachers to work in. The government continues to be silent when teachers are frustrated. The students can be transferred to take learning elsewhere because the population going to school in northern Kenya is not as big that cannot be accommodated elsewhere. But those schools those in those regions need not to have teachers at this particular time. And therefore, action is required from the Teacher Service Commission. Now, police are following leads after intercepting a vehicle laden with explosives in Meriti, Isiolo. The vehicle is believed to have been heading to Nairobi for a wide scale terror attack. An Al Shabaab gunman was killed in the shootout while another was arrested. The officers recovered a cache of vans, including 36 grenades and five automatic rifles. The cache, which also included improvised electronic devices, detonators, mobile phones and knives, are suspected to belong to Al-Shabaab militia. Preliminary investigations showed that the impounded vehicles or vehicle was heading to Nairobi, where the terrorists planned to use it as a vehicle bone explosive device. Further investigations also revealed that the vehicle was assembled by Al-Shabaab experts in al Ade, Somalia. Nandi Hills Member of Parliament Alfred Keter and two of his co-accused spent the night in police custody. The three who were arrested on Friday for what the police claim was presenting forged treasury bills to the Central Bank of Kenya are finally recorded statement of the DCI Directorate of Criminal Investigations Headquarters. There was restricted movement of persons and vehicles entering or leaving the Mudaiga police station where Nandi Hills Member of Parliament Alfred Ketel and two of his associates are guests of the state. Ketel's lawyer Kimutai Bosek was here to check on his client perhaps to ascertain when he will be due in court. They might want to arrange him in court tomorrow because obviously they could not take him to court on uh, Saturday or, or today Sunday. They arrested him on uh, Friday but it has been a very trying moment for him being denied uh, access to his normal life. According to Bosek, his client and two of his associates are yet to record statements or to get formally charged three days after they were arrested. The police are not telling him anything. The police in Modega are saying that uh, they really don't know why they were asked to keep him in, in custody. And that is a matter that is supposed to be dealt with by the CID headquarters. At the moment, there is no communication at ever from the CID headquarters. The police are reportedly waiting for the Central Bank of Kenya to present its evidence before charging the three with forgery. <laughs> Moiben member of parliament Silas Tiren, who was also among legislators who visited Ketel at the Mudaiga police station, claims that he's being punished for being a Jubilee rebel. Arresting Ketel and putting him in is not going to silence him. In fact, he's going to fight harder for the right of Kenyans. I believe he's doing his roles. What I would only suggest, and I'll talk to our leaders, or the executive, or our, or our president, or the, and the deputy president. This is not the Kenya we want. We want a Kenya that is free for all of us. 
The two legislators have had a running with the party, which culminated to their dramatic ouster from the Parliament Labour and Agriculture House Committees, respectively. I'm not complaining. They came to me. Ketel, together with Arthur Sakwa and Madat Chatur, were dramatically arrested by officers drawn from the Banking Fraud Investigation Unit for allegedly presenting forged 90-day treasury bills amounting to close to 700 million shillings dated 1990 to Central Bank of Kenya. Even as the Nandi member of parliament and two others spent another night in police custody, his supporters have threatened to use other means to ensure that their leader is released with immediate effect, said Olale, NTV, Udega Police Station. Now the Luya nation has been challenged to reorganize itself and or end political bickering and forge unity ahead of a 2022 general election. The message delivered to, or I should say, at a meeting of Luya leaders in Kakamega County came at a time divisions have emerged in the Muleme nation of Musalim Davadi's no-show during the swearing-in of Raila Odinga as the people's president. A section of leaders have castigated Mudavadi over his move with some withdrawing their support for his leadership and presidential ambition. But, of course, the meeting resolved that the former Sabata MP was still the community's best shot at the presidency. Throwing mud and speaking recklessly, what have they actually put in to create that NASA? Where do they sit to even try and understand the challenges we in the summit may be going through as we navigate these heavy waters? We are not going to solve it by abusing each other. We have to have a unity of purpose. And ladies and gentlemen, let us now send messages so that we get together, we put events behind us, and we start for focusing on those issues because we should not reach 2022 when we have not resolved those issues. We should uh, move forward with the decorum. We should move forward with stating issues and not personalizing issues. That's the only way we can move forward as we go towards the year 2022. Deputy President William Ruto says no one is above the law and he is therefore asking all Kenyans to respect the rule of law regardless of whether they support the Jubilee government or not. Ruto at the same time extended an olive branch to the NASA coalition to engage the Jubilee government in talks about policies and wait for another political contest in 2022. None of us is above the law. So wale ndugu zetu wote hata kama uko upinzani it doesn't mean you are above the law this shall continue to be a country of the rule of law it cannot be the rule of men our duty is to uphold the rule of law and we will continue doing exactly that and uh, if people disobey the court orders we will punish them within the law wale wako the other side they are not our enemies they are our competitors. Jameni kwa heshima, there is always another contest. Tunawaomba kwa heshima, tusikoroge nchi, tusikorogane, sisi kwa heshima, nyinyi ni viongozi, tunawaheshimu. Sasa, mambo imekwisha ya uchaguzi, uchaguzi hile hiko, ni ya huko 2022. Sasa hapa mujipange, katikati hapa, sisi nasi tujipange, tuunge sera, Tutahakikisha agenda ya serekani ku ya Big Four is part of our CIDP for the next period. Time now to drill deeper to the politics, politics of, of course, last week. We hack back to what was happening. A lot of uh, the stories we ran for you also will be forming 
as a, or acting as a segue to our discussion this morning. Allow me to introduce our panelists this morning. We have with us Senator Moses Kajon from Homer Bay. Also, we do have with us uh, Pogisio, Samuel Pogisio, who is a senator from West Pokot. We do have with us as well the global leader of Kenya Diaspora Alliance. This is the Dr. Shemu Chodo. And also, we do have the head of content at the Star and Radio Africa, David Bakali, to also chime in this morning. Of course, you can head over to our Twitter handle, which is AMLiveNTV. And also, AMLiveNTV is a profile name on Facebook, 20505 is our SMS portal. A very good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Right. Just hugging back to what was happening last week, we can begin with, uh, uh, of course, you being a lawyer, uh, Moses Kajuan, we can actually start with the Yellow Ribbon campaign that uh, you marched from Milimani Courts uh, way all the way to Supreme Court uh, last week. So from that particular exercise, what was the outcome? Uh, thank you, Debal. Debal, I, I think I, I need to first of all um, demystify my profession. Uh, Samuel Fogisi and oh, I, ah, yes. and uh, <laughs> Shea Mochuodo and uh, David McCalli. Information we, technology. We, we, I'm an information scientist, yes, but information I am scientist. a lawmaker right now. Yes. And uh, a lawmaker and the Yellow Ribbon campaign is a bit distinct. Yes. But um, I think the lawyers are responding to certain pertinent issues that are going on that they believe is crippling the space, the democratic space, is crippling um, the, the judicial space. <laughs> and uh, I sympathize with them a lot. I do believe, and you've seen it said several times, we've seen um, even lawmakers from the Jubilee Divide. Yes talking about uh, misuse of uh, due process, misuse of uh, court process, misuse of the powers of the police. Uh, we saw it in uh, two weeks uh, back after the swearing in yes. of Raila Odinga. We saw people uh, being picked by the police in um, uh, scenes reminiscent of uh, the Nyayo days and the Mwakenya days. Mm -hmm. We saw uh, defiance of court orders. In fact, the defiance of court orders did not even start uh, with, the, with the swearing in. It started a long time back. The media itself uh, was up in arms that uh, there was a shutdown. Uh, despite uh, the court ordering that media houses be reopened, there was uh, you know, strict uh, firm defiance of, of, of court orders. So there's a lot. There's, there's a gathering storm. And that gathering storm does not affect only lawyers. It affects every single Kenyan. And uh, there is reason for us to worry. When we were running around chasing after TJ Kajuang and Miguna Miguna, yes. uh, we, it reminded us of that saying that first they came for uh, Makali and we kept quiet. They came for Ochuodo, we came quiet. And when they came for me, there was no one to defend me. And so when I, I listened to the Moiben MP, mm -hmm. uh, when he went to see uh, Keter, uh, saying that uh, this is an abuse of process, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he, he's more or less left on his own. So we, this gathering storm, this looming storm, is something that we need to deal with. We need to puncture it. Because if you have a system uh, or a government, an, an executive, or even a legislature that does not respect the orders of a court, then uh, you know, we are hurtling towards uh, anarchy. All right, so are we hurtling towards anarchy uh, going by the events of uh, last week, of course, also with the arrest of Qatar? And are they saying the due process was not really follow followed? Today is when now, that actually, they're going to uh, to be charged in court, right? Without even, uh, you know, uh, on a current book, uh, you know, recording the events of what really happened last week. So uh, are we really jumping the cart as far as following uh, due process is concerned, Oshimeo? Well, I think we should, uh, first of all, agree on what we define as the rule of law. I think we have to come to a common agreement. I heard uh, Deputy President here saying, uh, no one is above the law. That is actually the bottom uh, line. Yes. No one should be above the law, and that's what the rule of law is. And so once we agree on what the, the rule of law is, then we understand uh, everyone has uh, rights, and, and all rights, of course, come with responsibilities. And, and I think we agree that uh, so things like uh, court orders uh, should be obeyed. Uh, that, that, is, that is the rule of law. Mm -hmm. and, and so the, uh, our lawyers in their society are part of an international community of lawyers, yes. and, and they, they cannot just watch as um, uh, we, 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 we run out of uh, uh, fuel on, mm -hmm. on, on this thing called the rule of law. So I do believe that uh, that is, uh, at least that, that should be established as, as a basis for our discussions, because 
even when you come to these uh, MPs uh, who have all the time been arrested, arrested on a weekend so that they spend, you actually make sure they spend the weekend uh, in police cells. Uh, and, and when you know exactly, okay, let them play by the rules, but play by the law, exactly as the law says. Um, uh, nobody defends somebody if they commit a crime. Mm -hmm because we have lawyers to do that. But at least there's, uh, there's something about how you deal with people who are elected uh, and, and, and who are um, you know, not necessarily a threat to anything. So I, I do believe that that's what the Rift Valley MPs were saying this last week. Mm -hmm. uh, one of their own uh, is being locked up and no charges preferred for a week. So, so are, we, are we ready to say that we are going to be governed by the rule of law? Is this country coming to agree on that, that definition? and who, who is above the law. I mean, you basically say, look who he's talking to, because who's, who, who is showing that you can actually be above the law? So those are the things that I, I'm talking about. And mm -hmm. I don't necessarily agree with uh, members uh, being harassed, uh, being given. It doesn't matter which side of the divide they are. Yes. Uh, they are protected also by the way that they represent a number of people uh, as they proceed to their work. They're not supposed to be harassed or uh, 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 prevented from performing their duties. Right, but the president, uh, deputy president, has been very categorical that no one is above the law. We should actually, you know, toe the line as far as uh, the law is concerned. Do you think, in any way, uh, uh, Alfred Keter is being subjected to all this, uh, so to speak, uh, mistreatment because of his position, as far as you know, uh, the chairperson of the committees is concerned? Uh, there's no telling because, uh, you know, if, if it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it must be a duck. And, and that's basically uh, uh, what, what, uh, what, what comes to mind immediately mm -hmm. because of the recent events and following on that, what has he done? So I do, I do believe that uh, I, I, like, I, like, I like to see young, vibrant politicians coming up and give them a chance. Uh, those of us who have gone through this for many years have had our day when we actually had to be independent-minded, and, and, I, and I do believe uh, even the deputy president himself met where he is by being independent-minded. Uh, you have to allow these young people opportunities to grow their political, uh, to make their political uh, debut, mm -hmm. and, and allow them to actually create some kind of independence right. and grow. Right, let's hear from Dr. Shema Chodhi. <coughs> morning. Uh, the Bal morning, I, I think uh, Honorable Kater deserves rightful treatment within the confines of the law. Not so much because he's a honorable member of parliament, but every Kenyan is uh, entitled to be guided by the just administration of law. Uh, so to that extent, uh, obviously, as uh, the senator here says, uh, uh, we cannot condone uh, uh, if there are criminalities. Uh, of course, it will be for due process to say that. We're just hoping it's not uh, somebody settling uh, political scores, because then that would be an abuse to the, our law, the Kenyan law. But I, I also want to add uh, the bell that uh, the judiciary is the moral compass, compass for any society. And in our particular case, uh, I'm a bit uh, concerned uh, at some of the things that I see ongoing uh, in terms of uh, interference, if one may, uh, with the judiciary. I'm pretty concerned at uh, the appointment of the Judicial Service Commission and uh, talking for the forgotten Kenyans, uh, I'm very concerned that uh, they never, the diaspora never seemed to make it uh, into Im important institutions like this, despite requests that we have eminent lawyers, uh, senior lawyers, both inside and outside the country, that uh, should be considered. Uh, I, I think, uh, I'm hoping that when it comes to Parliament. Uh, I'm, I'm not. I would want to believe that the JSC members to get vetted. I think we want to see the face of Kenya, and we also want to see equity and inclusiveness. And inclusiveness here includes both those inside and outside the country. So I'm really a bit concerned at uh, the recent appointment. I'm hoping that uh, there is no effort to uh, dilute uh, or to control or regulate the JSC because the moment you take charge of that, you can literally take charge of the judiciary. Right. Having said that, uh, I, 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 I like when the deputy president says that uh, nobody's above the law. But I think we need to go beyond words. Uh, let's, let's also practice that because um, when NASA purports to, um, to swear in the people's president outside the law, mm -hmm. and then at the same time we are saying let's comply with the law, 
or when the courts, or when, when government continues to clamp down on media, when the courts have said release, uh, allow the media to go back on air, uh, what are we saying? Are we really complying with the law? So I think I like what he says, but uh, let let all Kenyans, regardless of their political shades, comply with the rule of law. Right, thank you. Otherwise, we get into anarchy. All right, let's hear from uh, David Makali. Well, uh, um, I'm waiting to see what uh, charges, if any, the state will prefer against uh, Alfred Keter. Um, because from what is coming out, it looks like, uh, as Mohishmiwa Pogishev says, if it smells and sings and does all those things like a duck, it must be. And uh, the circumstances in which uh, Alfred was arrested really, really stink. Uh, and, and his explanations so far, which are in the public domain, are, to say the least, um, um, very strong, are very strong. I would, I, would be, I, would be, I would be very, very, very curious to see what the state says about the documentation which has come out and which we have reported about how he got involved in the, in the, in the Treasury Bills uh, saga, because he says he was called and he was performing his task as uh, his responsibilities as an MP. Um, and then you end up with uh, the dramatic manner in which he was arrested, everything looks set up. Uh, on, on this one, I think the state has a lot to explain, or the police have a lot to explain uh, on what transpired. Um, the matter of the law and the, the disobedience of court orders, I think, to be honest, this country is suffering from a general uh, 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 you know, failure in that respect across the board. Uh, both government and the general public and the opposition as well because uh, you know I've had the arguments that look why are you saying we should uh, uh, follow court orders and yet uh, when uh, the Supreme Court made a, a fundamental uh, ruling uh, the opposition itself failed to comply with that order and mm -hmm. persists today in defying that order and, and, and finding on the validity of the last election. So it is, it is a matter on which um, I, I think very few people uh, you know, speaking in the public domain and polit on both political sides uh, would claim innocence. Finally, I think with regard to enforcing those orders and the solidarity which uh, the law society and the lawyers fraternity in this country needs, I think once again the public uh, has failed uh, to give support where it's due. I mean, the lawyers seem to be fighting this as if it was their own uh, uh, battle. But yes, they're officers of the court and part of the uh, you know, legal system but, but lawyers go there to represent the ordinary citizens. So the, the course of, of um, the, yellow, the yellow ribbon campaign and, and the, the pressure to abide by court uh, rulings and orders uh, is a public thing that needs to be taken up by the country. I'm seeing a certain you know, death of um, uh, uh, a civic duty in, in the public arena when a matter that affects the public generally comes up you are not seeing the public rallying in solidarity. People are back in their shops. Everybody seems to be, I'm on my own. That is their business. So that when, for example, the media were, 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 were switched off uh, uh, illegally, because I did not see the government cite any particular law it used to actually put off those uh, radio stations. None. I saw an, an, a letter that was sent to our, our group, for example, uh, demanding that uh, KTN be switched off the signal, uh, the Bamba's uh, platform. And there was no citation of any law. It was just a letter saying you've been up, you know, directed to switch off the station. I mean, that is no rule of law. So when you hear the deputy president talking about uh, uh, rule of law, which law? Mm -hmm. It should start right there. So we, we want to see people and the public outraged about these violations. Not that when something happens to a particular sector of society, it is left to be a matter of that society. So the matter of rule of law is a public uh, affair that should draw everybody's attention. The, 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 uh, I've seen, for example, in, when, when sectors such as the medical fraternity doctors or, or lecturers go on strike, people leave it to them. You know, everybody is, is, is dealing with a small kiosk. Eventually, this kind of authoritarianism, this uh, lack of rule of law is going to catch up with the country. So I think we need to do something about civic education and how we should prosecute and defend our rights. And that is a constitutional mandate and, and prerogative. All right. I think uh, civic education is very key. Uh, right now, we know also that uh, should be part of uh, the, um, the Ministry of uh, Devolution and also the Ministry. Uh, um, it's a devolved function. It's a, it's a under, devo under <laughs> but also, I think it's, it's a national function implied. Uh, because every institution always has a public mandate uh, to, to extend or educate the public about what it does and how it can defend uh, its, its space. But with the previous regimes, we know it was under the, the remit of the Ministry of Justice. 
we don't know how that one was also uh, distributed because now we, we wonder where do we uh, you know try and point accusatory fingers if, if that is not effective I think it's, the, it's, it's not uh, any particular, I wouldn't say it's any particular department of state or government. It is our civic responsibility as citizens inherent in our abilities and in our, our position as, as, as persons, as individuals, to defend our rights. And the things we're talking about fall within the, general, the broad scope of public affairs, common interest that everybody needs to switch on. Right. without prompting. Right. Uh, as we're closing on that, uh, maybe uh, Moses Kajong, you can tell us, because it seems now, since it's our, actually our duty, everyone, to actually you know, participate in civic education. So everyone is thinking, oh, yeah, I'll leave it to Pongisho to do it, I'll leave it to, for IBC to do it, I'll leave it for my... So there is no one... Yeah, or Mutata actually <laughs> to go to the courts as well, isn't it? So no one will be actually doing anything at the end of the day because now I'm, I'm just thinking, oh, David McCalla is going to do it or whichever institution is going to do it. So how do we now progressively go ahead and have a proper s structured civic education, briefly? I, I think, Dibal, it's also a, a reflection of the failure of our politics. When you look at the Constitution and its emphasis on public participation in everything that goes on, that public participation, in a way, is part of that civic education. That when you're doing a budget, when you're doing legislation, when you're coming up with regulations, you need to involve the public and explain to them what that means for them and how it's going to impact on their lives. So you realize that it's not the function of a specific ministry okay. or one single entity. Be it parliament, be it county assembly, be it regulation making entities, they are supposed to carry the public along with them. But if you look at the conversation right now, political conversation, be it at the ward level all the way to counties to the nation, people are talking about 2022. And that is quite unfortunate because for you to talk about 2022 when you've just come from an election, it is important that you are able to catalog your successes and to catalog the things that you've done and how you brought the people along with you. So we need to have a way of looking at our politics differently. You know, the next elections are four years away, mm -hmm. but at the national level, we're already talking 2022. Mm -hmm. At counties, we're already talking succession. So uh, we are feeding our people with so much politics, but it is politics without content. Mm -hmm. It is politics of personality. It is politics that is, uh, you know, revolves around the individuals that are in power at that point in time. Uh, right. So it, it requires a, a, a radical shift. And finally, the ball, this constitution requires county governments to promote accountable and democratic governance and to ensure that there is consultation at the lowest level. In fact, the constitution calls even for formation of village councils. And that was a way of that the intention there was to involve the people in the running of government, in the affairs of government, and understanding their civil rights. But that has not been done. And so it is not uh, the failure of a ministry, but a collective failure of the political establishment in this country. All right, but we want to also drill deeper when we come back and try and see, because we know also the Ministry of Devolution has dispensed uh, you know, money into the counties on how they can carry out a civil education as well. So we want to know where does this money go? You are the senators will tell us, do you receive this money? Where is it, uh, uh, how is it uh, uh, accountable, accounted for when it comes to, you know, rolling out civic education also within the counties? You can join uh, the conversation also on the other side of the break. We continue the discussion with our panelists here. We want to take a short break. It is seven on the nose. When we come back, we look deeper on the civic education and look at a raft of other issues as well. Don't go away. The Kenya Union of Post-Primary Education Teachers, COPET, wants the Teachers Service Commission to withdraw teachers from the northern part of Kenya until their security is guaranteed. The Union Secretary General, Akelo Misuri, says the students can be accommodated the new Bear schools in the meantime. Police are following leads after intercepting a vehicle laden with explosives in Meriti Isiolo. The vehicle is believed to have been heading to Nairobi for a wide scale terror attack. An Al Shabaab gunman was killed in the shootout while another was arrested. The officers recovered a cache of arms, including 36 grenades. Nani Hills Member of Parliament Alfred Keter and two of his co accused us spent the night, I should say. In police custody, the three who were arrested on Friday for what police claim was presenting forged treasury bills to the Central Bank of Kenya have finally recorded statements of the DCI. Are you watching? This is a point here on AM Live. We continue with the conversation with our...
panelists. I'm holding court this morning with uh, Senator Moses Kajuang from Homo Bay. Also do have with us Senator Samuel Pogisio from West Pokot. Also do have with us Dr. Shemo Chodo, who's a global leader of Kenya Diaspora Alliance. With us as well is David McCalley, who's the head of content at uh, the Star and Radio Africa. Gentlemen, we, we continue a bit with the conversation. We promise to circle back with the issue of public uh, public participation, uh, especially in civic education. And I was asking this question, money has been rolled out, we're given to understand from the Ministry of Devolution, uh, specifically for c civic education dispensed within the counties. How is that panning out? Or maybe you're not privy to this as well. Uh, well, Dibal, I, I know the Ministry of Devolution has been helping counties to come up with a framework on public participation. Yes. And I also know that Parliament has uh, come up with certain proposal on public participation. We had a bill on public participation that I believe lapsed in the last parliament. Mm -hmm. I also know that uh, certain counties have passed legislation mm -hmm. through their county assemblies on public participation. The Ministry of Devolution yes. would uh, send funds to counties on public participation through an intergovernmental arrangement. Mm -hmm. But the 300 billion that we give counties every year, there should be sufficient uh, resources out of that for them to conduct civic education and for them to conduct public participation because it, it has become a requirement. I remember Matiangi was talking about uh, a new, um, I think a new monster in town called public participation. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure that that happens because uh, we've seen many regulations, many issues that have been passed by assemblies but reversed by courts because sufficient public participation was not mm -hmm. uh, undertaken. Mm -hmm. So we gave the example of public participation as one of the uh, means in which the, the, the community and citizens can be made more aware about their civic obligations. But I, I believe that the point that was raised by David McCulley earlier is a matter that should concern Kenyans. The sense of outrage when things are going bad. Yes. The sense of outrage when the Auditor General tells us that billions have been lost. When the control of budget tells us that 99.2 billion shillings in terms of pending bills is still lying out, uh, out there in counties. The sense of outrage when you hear MCAs and even parliamentarians and even members of the executive spending 200 million shillings on domestic travel. The sense of outrage when we see the police acting in ways that uh, we do not en envisage in the new constitution. It is that sense of outrage that then fuels the kind of changes that we probably see in Ethiopia. Ethiopia was a very close society. Mm -hmm. It was uh, almost seen as an autocracy. Yes. But we are seeing that when people are outraged sufficiently, mm -hmm. uh, they, they, will be, they will get to a point where they are able to even change the political leadership of that country. Yes. So we need to ask ourselves, what happened to that sense of outrage? And I think that uh, our, our politics and our country has been uh, for a long time held hostage by certain politics of patronage, uh, the kind of politics where leaders get into power uh, just with the objective of accessing goodies and accessing cash. Mm -hmm. And once they access that cash, they use it over and over to bribe people to re-elect them into office. Uh, you know, you've gotten to a point where you can have a cabinet secretary nominee who tells the whole world that education is not important. What is important is uh, what you've been able to do with yourself. We've had people in very high levels of leadership who tell you that, uh, you know, I'm a hustler, I've made my money. It doesn't matter how I made my money. What matters is that I have the money. So we, we need to, uh, you know, reinstate that sense of outrage. That is lacking. And I don't know whether civic education is going to reawaken that in our people, mm -hmm. but uh, indeed <coughs> it is required. Indeed it, it is required. And of course we're looking at that editorial cartoon in the, in the star as well. Uh, if we may just put it up, we can see yeah, that the Crown and rule in Ethiopia right now, Halimarim Desaleng has been forced to, to resign. Uh, going with the events also in this country as well, we saw Attorney General Githu Mugai also uh, bringing a shocker and resigning as well. We don't know if he was prevailed upon to, to resign. Reconstitution of some of the institutions that we have in this country, so many people are talking about also the Cabinet Secretary that we'll discuss uh, in a moment. Some of the dockets that were in the, you know, within certain ministries being moved or shifted to other ministries as well. We can talk of uh, housing now going to transport. Uh, you know, uh, previously it was... Uh, where was it before? Uh, it was in Lands. It was in Lands. 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 In Lands, yes, it was in Lands. So yeah, Lands has transport. actually been, right. yes. So right now it's been taken to transport, and urban planning as well has been taken to transport. Well, from your own perception, what is really happening uh, as far as, far as uh, the rule of, of law is concerned? Are we now teetering on the age of uh, draconian rule? 
Dival, I think one of the things that I have said even here before is that this is Uhuru Kenyatta's government with William Ruto. I mean, this, these people can organize the government the way they want. Um, again, we must, we must agree that they have the power to change ministries, change ministers, move, move departments, and so on, to achieve their manifesto. And I hope that is the whole purpose, for the chief manifesto. And, um, and, and for that reason, I, I, have n I don't have um, <coughs> any reason to even think that maybe there is um, some under, and underhandedness in, in, in that. Mm -hmm. uh, I was going to revisit the whole issue of Kenyans, that for everything that is going to happen to us, we must begin to see that we made gains uh, in, in, in democratization, in democracy, and so on. We made gains in the rule of law, and we must begin to protect some of those gains together. You know, you know this thing about saying, okay, like like my friend uh, Kajong was saying, they have come for, they came for so and so, they have gone for so and so. Now it's for, now I cannot have anyone to protect me. It, it's because we don't have a united uh, protection, a, a united um, uh, a way of protecting our own democratic gains, um, and, and and this way, uh, if you lose it, if you lose them, someday we'll all suffer together. So so we must. We must agree that some of these gains have to be protected. Number two, on the issue of uh, public participation, it must be said, uh, in my view, that we standardize uh, basic standards of what, uh, what amounts to uh, public participation. Because do, do they really do have public participation, or is it just a report that we had public participation? What are the basic? Uh, uh, what, what is the basic agenda that must be included in, in public participation? Who must participate, and so on? Uh, there is, of course, a, there is a, a struggle where the uh, executive of the counties have to try and hurry through their programs, and so some of them avoid public participation or jump over them. Uh, so, what is basic? What are we allowing to say to agree that this is this is the public participation? If we don't have that, then everybody has their own idea of what public participation is. All right. Uh, Debal, I think these two issues are so important uh, that our democracy is anchored upon them, civic education and uh, public participation. I remember around the year 2001, while campaigning for the former president, uh, Kibaki, that's under NAC, in Loitoktok with the late um, Minister Geoffrey Parpai, I'm there asking us, hey, Vijana, what happened to Mze Kenyatta? That, you know, that time, <laughs> President Kenyatta had not even been anointed or as the Kanu flag bearer. So what happened to Kenyatta that you were asking us to, us to vote for Kibaki? You know, Kenyatta died more than 30 years ago by that time. Of course, now we are talking of almost oh, it's 40 years now. It looks like they're Kenyans or they're part of Kenya who 30 years on were still wondering, why are you asking us to vote for somebody else? That's the person they still knew. Now, I'm sure there are similar cases from uh, far-flung areas, uh, northeastern or even Lamu, uh, where even KBC signals are not received. There are areas of this country which don't get radio as we know it, even FM radios as, mm -hmm. as we know them. So the aspect of civic education is so important. It's unfortunate that voter education which is just a small segment of uh, civic education is conducted mm -hmm. by IBC. They always say that we, it's not us to do civic education. I think there are NGOs that are doing this, uh, and I think it's important, and perhaps this is a call to members of parliament. Uh, I, the bill that uh, elapsed, really, we need, when we talk of public participation, I agree with my colleagues, we need to define exactly what does that mean? Is it just good enough for a parliamentary committee to put out an announcement in a newspaper? We know that newspapers, the highest circulation, are read by less than 10% of Kenyans. So 90% of Kenyans, when you put something in the newspapers, they, they haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. So we, even with the best of intentions, I think it's so important that we come with the public participation law so that it's clear, so that it makes sense. The nation of values, I think, a lot of it is missing out on, on Kenyans. I, I rem once in a while, even though I'm a former member of parliament, uh, coming from the village back to Nairobi, wanainchi wanakuambia, ukienda Nairobi, omba sirikali, utuombe sirikali, I keep saying no. The new constitution gave you the power. It's you, the government should be serving. It shouldn't be the opposite, you ombaring 
serikali to saidia and so on. But part of this is because civic education has not really penetrated, uh, percolated down to the grassroots, and this needs to be done. All so, right. Okay, Let, let's hear from uh, Makali briefly. Uh, we wind up on it. Yeah, uh, briefly, I think, uh, Dibal, one can uh, comfortably say that uh, the state is never interested in civic education because an enlightened citizenship or citizenry is not necessarily in the interest of a controlling state. And so this has also gone down to the county governments. If you look at any of the county governments and their operations, you will not find any framework Seriously speaking, there could be attempts, but there is no serious framework for public participation in decision making at the county level. And so that goes back to Senator Pogisho and uh, Kajuang to really fast track any legislation or framework which can be made mandatory for the county governments to ensure that people are the grassroots. And that's the whole point of devolution. That's why we create a county government. So that's the Kali in Awezakwa Karibu Wananchi. We are not seeing that happening. We have just created another national government at the local level, which uh, uh, citizens are struggling to relate with. Now, the uh, pursuant to that, that public participation, there's also no civic education at all going on. I know from my county, uh, there was no civic education I ever saw happening. So, and, and if you look at the budget, perhaps it might be necessary to say a certain percentage of that budget must go towards this particular function. So limited to 10% of the budgets that they get must go towards activities that can be described as civic education and public participation. And the frameworks clearly established and legislated in that manner so that there is no government that can dodge. Uh, I think that, you know, so actually say, there, there's no budget right now as it, as it stands. We well, have no budget dedicated to that. You'll find very minimal. And since civic education falls under the Department of Public Administration in the county government ministries, the, 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 the devout functions, mm -hmm. you'll see ministries, I mean, county governments are about nine or ten uh, ministries. The civic education function is supposed to be cross-cutting in all activities of the county governments, but civic education, or rather, public participation is supposed to be a general function in every uh, activity undertaken by the county government. Mm -hmm. But civic education is supposed to be a function of the public administration department in the county government. If you go and look at the budgets there, you'll hardly find any allocations worth talking about. Governors, county governments don't want an enlightened citizenship because it will be troublesome to their governance <laughs> and, and uh, making decision making mm -hmm. because they want to allocate resources right. according to their whims. Now, blow that up to the national level. Look at what has been happening to the civil society in the last 10 years. There's emasculation of the civil society. They can't even breathe because it's almost a stated policy at the national level that civil society is dangerous to government or that they are a nuisance. So we have seen all these manner of things, Fazul's actions on the NGO Coordination Board. You have seen the Public Benefits uh, Organization Act, which has not you know, been implemented. There are all these challenges. Why? Because there is a certain fear of civil society, because civil society takes the lead in civic education of the people so they can demand their rights and extract uh, good governance. So unless we change that and from the national to the county level, we're just going to go round and round. And that's why the civil society has been dying in this mm -hmm. country since 2002. It's been on a decline. Right. Senator uh, Moses Kajuang and Senator uh, Pogisu, I think also that should be, you know, squarely under your remit to make sure that there is a legislation yeah. to try and put it into perspective that is just not left amorphously running, that we don't know uh, how to handle civic education and public participation. So what is the way forward, very briefly? Well, well I wish, um, you know, people say that uh, uh, Uhuru is uh, on his last term, so he's keen on a legacy. We need to very firmly deal with this appetite that elected leaders have for implementation of projects. And what do I mean? You have ward reps asking for ward development funds. You have national assembly members managing CDF. And you've got an increasing clamor for anyone who's elected. He wants to have some money so that he can go back home and build a school here and build a church there. I think we need to have a a shift of mind and a shift of thinking that we as elected leaders and, and, and as elected representatives of the people, we have a duty to create that civic awareness on the part of our people. But it becomes a contradiction if you are the one implementing projects, you are the one oversighting them, you are the one representing and you are the one legislating. We need to draw a line. And I can tell you, Dibal, I know this is a very controversial uh, issue and uh, will not attract a lot of admiration from my colleagues. But even the issues of CDF, I know there's a matter that is alive in court. 
things that CDF are doing are things that should be done by county governments. The ward development funds, we must find a way of channeling that through county governments so that the ward representative has a duty to be talking to his people and creating that civic awareness. DOs and DCs of the past used to be given targets, KPIs, and an example of the KPIs was conduct four barazas every month. A member of National Assembly or Senator does not have such KPIs. And so I can come to Nairobi and my KPI is attendance of parliamentary sessions because if I don't attend parliamentary sessions, this constitution says that I will lose my seat after eight consecutive sittings. So as we look at public participation, whether it should be done by Ministry for Devolution, whether it should be done by counties, but we also must find a role for elected leaders in that. Mm -hmm. And that can only happen if elected leaders are not involved in implementation of projects. Let elected leaders be the people who go out there and mobilize the aspirations and the thinkings of the people and create that civic awareness. Thank you. Yeah, let's hear from uh, Senator Pungis. Well, the, the whole idea of uh, elected leaders being able, therefore, to uh, oversight the executive, it cannot be gainsaid. Yes. I, I think that's very important. And so uh, when, when you see that um, uh, activities like civic education are not done, it's, it's really our responsibility to raise those issues. But I didn't want Debal to go without... Uh, you might think that we, we glossed over your 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 um, that picture over there, and and I, I thought I thought you raised an issue about that. Yes, I, My understanding of that uh, is that uh, that big foot, that big foot over there, over the people, yes, has begun to be resisted and has begun to feel uh, the, the the power of the people, and I, and I think that uh, there's been a wind of change uh, going through this continent, uh, and, and and I do believe that uh, it's a conscience of our people that, that maybe time has come for, for, for Africans, African countries, to begin to look at their own populations uh, in a democratic way. And I think that, that to me speaks volumes. Uh, I haven't been to Ethiopia lately, but I think what I'm following is, is that uh, there's a change coming into that country. Um, but for those of us, you know, we are really praised internationally, it's Kenya, mm -hmm. for being a very democratic country uh, and being very stable. Uh, in, in the middle of all these things, uh, you find that we, we have gains that, like I said, that, that we must protect. Because the name of the Kenya, Kenya, Kenya sounds like a very stable country, a country that's reached uh, uh, a very mature democratization process and democracy. And I think that's why it's, 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 a, it's a really a call to all Kenyans that we must uh, accord ourselves that title, that we don't slide into situations uh, like that. All right. Uh, I can see the uh, smile is rich large on uh, David yeah. McCallie's face. And, uh, <laughs> at the ball, I think talking of civic education, perhaps uh, one of the major things that Kenyans need to know, the perception of Kenyans, what's the role of an MP, is to bring about development, which is far from, nothing could be further from the truth. That's not defined anywhere in the Constitution as a role of the function of a member of parliament. There are three major functions of a member of parliament. Uh, representation, legislation, and oversight. So none of that has got to do with bringing about development. But the ordinary Kenyan you talk to, oh, Atakwambia, good MP is the one who brings us a road or does for us electricity or boreholes or whatever it is, mm -hmm. which in, in truth really isn't a function of parliament, but sorry, of, of members of parliament. So I think the, the aspect of civic education here is, is extremely important. But I also wanted to say, even though we're talking about civic education being in devolution in the counties, there is also the element of civic education at the national level. And there is also the need for standardization of that civic education. Somebody needs to come up with standard uh, curriculum. Uh, I would want to believe that some of the institutions of learning uh, teach civic education or what borders on it. But I think this needs to be totally streamlined. It needs to be put in an appropriate ministry. Perhaps uh, the ministry that coordinates national or government function should be doing that. Thank but you. of course the part that deals with the countries can go to the Ministry of Devolution. But this is something that needs to be taken seriously. All right, maybe I should also pick up uh, with you, David McCallie, because uh, we've, we've seen, uh, yes, uh, Musala Mudavadi met with uh, you know, Koto leader that is a Tuoli, and they're saying that the, the, the Luan the nation is being challenged to reorganize itself and politic, political bickering and forge unity ahead of the 2022 uh, general election. And of course, people are saying, you know, the fact that Musalia didn't appear for the swearing in, that in itself was 
putting his political life on the chopping block as well. So how would he come out from this morass? Because he seems to have actually to stolen his own thunder, but not really appearing that particular on that particular ceremony that uh, was uh, in uh, in January. So is there, you know, a relief? Is there? A way forward for Musalia politically? <laughs> uh, did he really uh, put himself on the chopping block? <laughs> Very brief. Uh, that, was, uh, that was tricky. <laughs> 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 I, I, I don't think that, um, you know, it's not in the DNA of uh, Musalia Mudavadi to engage in the kind of politics that we have seen the last, um, in the countdown to the last election and, after, and afterwards. And I, I see a man who is a bit pushed. Uh, it's not his style. He's trying to be um, the radical shoes of the NASA coalition, but and he's trying to hold his own while not losing credibility, still de not departing from his character, which is the gentleman of politics. You know, Musalia is a, is a kibaki. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if I put it that way. Um, a lot has been said, of course, about his failure and the core principles to appear, the swearing in. And um, it will go, it's going to haunt them for some time to overcome that tag that, you know, they chickened out of an event they had charged people, uh, spoken uh, positively about, and then last minute don't show up. And the justification or reasons for, uh, for not showing up, I think, have not been sufficiently uh, propagated. They need to find a way to communicate their, their failure which I don't think they have succeeded. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so I think it's time to go back and, and go to appeal to his constituency, the, the main block um, where he springs from, which is Western and the Leo community to say, look, I am still your son and I have not departed. Um, we are still working and we're working carefully. And I think uh, he had good uh, company over the weekend uh, with, um, first of all, to regain the confidence and, and, and uh, and, and support of Atoli, who had you know, been very scuffing mm -hmm. against him, um, is something he must have really worked hard on. Uh, his back, I think, he has restored himself within the block of both who uh, support him and on whom he must depend. And I uh, see he has to find a new bearing going forward. I don't think it's damaged goods. It's not a damaged goods. Uh, let's hear from uh, <laughs> Kajuang, is it? Do you think it is not a damaged goods so far? Well, I uh, believe consistency is important in uh, any leadership role, be it political leadership, corporate leadership, or even uh, leadership in church or uh, you know, any other sector. I do recall that uh, a few days to the swearing in, we had a big rally in Homer Bay, and that was the last uh, People's Assembly meeting before we went to Huru Park. And uh, Musalia Mudavadi and Kalonzo Musioka were present. And they made very bold declarations. And uh, three, four days later, they did not show up at Uhuru Park. Musalia Mudavadi didn't have an oath to take. He would have come as an, uh, a, an attendant, just mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. I did. And so he, uh, if he had to be charged for treason, that would be alongside uh, 10,000 or 50,000 others. And so that lack of consistency could be worrying, especially for someone uh, who had such um, a seemingly bright uh, political star. Uh, I personally went around campaigning with Musalia Mudavadi. He came to my home county. He uh, took me, uh, you know, accompanied me to a few meetings. And I think he's a good man, and I think he's got a, the kind of mien that um, would mediate between the, the very radical positions that this country is taking. But when you're not consistent, even your troops some, uh, will desert you. Mm -hmm. Uh, ANC that is led by Musalia Mudavadi has got three senators, Malala, Haniri, and Petronila Were. The three were to Hurupak. And uh, you have seen some of them coming out very uh, hotly, Malala and uh, in a more subtle way, Haniri, uh, talking about the f feeling that they were left uh, uh, at the altar. Uh, and so Musalia Mudavadi will have to reboot himself. Uh, he will have to find a way of... Um, uh, getting his groove back as far as uh, credibility is concerned and consistency is concerned. I know that the events of 30th January were quite complicated for many people yeah. and uh, even for seasoned politicians like Musali and Kalonzo, they seemed to, there seemed to have been a disconnect between them and the people. Mm -hmm. I personally attended the People's Assembly Rally in Machakos, which was hosted by Kalonzo Musioka. And uh, Kalonzo and uh, Kivuta Kibwana were quite uh, surprised when they attempted to introduce the concept of dialogue. 
and the crowd that was dominantly MCAs and political players said that they did, were not interested in dialogue. So we've got a situation where the leadership part of the leadership does not seem to be reading accurately what their followers want. Mm -hmm. I think the long and short of it is that uh, there's this conversation that NASA is dead, NASA should be killed. I believe that NASA was f formed for certain reasons. One of them was for victory in the last elections. But secondly, I believe that the principals, when they came together, they had a shared vision of Kenya, which they thought they could achieve if they came together collectively. I do still believe, and, and I hold it to be true, that that shared vision still exists. What might undermine that shared vision would be concerns about 2022. But if they are true Democrats and if they are sons of this country who truly uh, crave for a better Kenya, mm -hmm. then those shared principles should be sufficient to hold them together mm -hmm. as NASA. All right, but we can see also from Salem Davidi uh, that particular you know tag that you're talking about in consistency as a leader has been a common streak, uh, you know, uh, seen with Medavadi right from you know the previous regimes that we've known. Even when uh, he was really campaigning to be the, the president, he was actually given a post by uh, President. Uh, 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 president Moy as a vice president, it shocked so many. And the, he was actually the president who's gone now in the annals of history as the vice president holding the shortest tint as a vice president in Kenya as well. We can talk about also 2013 and uh, the Madimoni saga we know that uh, visited uh, apparently some leaders and they said, okay, now uh, we cannot go with the Musali uh, Madavadi as well. So that particular, you know, flip flopping, you know, wishy washy sort of. Uh, uh, a font that people now seem to be associating it with Musala Mudavadi. Now this one also really came a cropper as well when it didn't really come uh, uh, or appeared at Uhuru Park as well. So that one has really emboldened. Do you think we've got any reason to trust? Him and Kalonzo seem, seem to be actually sailing on the same boat when it comes to flip-flopping, yeah, not consistent. And so uh, the general populace or maybe the general followers of Musali and Mudavadi uh, Musalia and Kalonzo will say these are no leaders that we want to follow because they're fickle. And about that notwithstanding, yeah, you'll find that uh, uh, Mudavadi seems to be uh, able to make his way back to his people in Western Kenya. Uh, whatever we think, uh, Mudavadi, even Kalonzo and, 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 uh, and, and Wetangula, all these are people that you, you would want to, uh, you, you can't dismiss even for the future mm -hmm. in, in our politics. Uh, for some reason, in spite of all the things that look like weaknesses, they still uh, manage to get back to their people. And I don't know whether it's for lack of uh, alternatives or whatever. Uh, you'll find that uh, uh, people still want them back uh, in, in one form or another. Uh, it, even for those of us who really uh, want to see dialogue in this country, uh, we, we, you'll find that you'll, you'll still need to talk to these same, same leaders, uh, in spite of what happened on the 30th. Mm -hmm. and, and on the 30th, it was a bit difficult because, um, uh, you know, I remember there, 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 there was one time when four students were, uh, came late and they were driving in one car, and one of the problems was the teacher just gave them a piece of paper and said, I want you to write only one thing, <laughs> because they claimed that they had a tire bust. Yes. And so the teacher simply said, which tire? Yeah. Which I went flat. Yeah, and, 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 and there were four different answers, and it was not easy. Uh, to yes. <laughs> so I, I, do, I do hope that they're over that. Somehow they need to get over that because they are needed in their regions uh, for any kind of uh, formation of politics in 2022. Mm -hmm. All right, let's hear from Dr. Shemacholo. Debel, I would want to extend an invitation to the former Deputy Prime Minister and the former Vice President uh, and uh, the former Foreign Affairs Minister at Angula. Let them come to the middle ground. I think that's where they belong, that's where they needed. That's what this country needs. Why do I say that? I am certainly not privy to why they ended up not being at Uhuru Park. I've had various versions and I've talked to a number of people. And, and which is the middle ground? Uh, the middle ground is uh, that. Uh, is that a former. Is that well, a Buddha triangle? The, the, middle, <laughs> the, middle, the middle ground is, you know, currently we have the very extreme people on the right. And we have the very extreme people on the left. There are those who are on the right, but not so extreme, like my brother here. So he's close to the middle ground. I think this is what Kenya lacks. In the past, we've had a very strong middle ground that uh, brings um, sanity and that's rational. 
because um, when Mwishimu Akajuang says that, uh, you know, the crowds didn't read the mood of the crowds, then I ask, what's a leader? Is it a leader that's leading from the back or from the front? The crowd is not always right, and particularly when we recognize that the crowd, most of the crowds lack civic education. So this is where we make a difference between a leader and a politician. You know, a politician would follow the crowds. But do you want to choose to be a, if you want to choose to be a statesman, then you can't be a politician. So to that extent, while I'm not private to what reasons uh, led Musalia or Kalonzo or Rectangula not to appear to Uru Park, I've also had issues of them saying, look, we're not just babies that are being tagged along. You can tag along your MP, MP, ODM MPs because they owe it to you. But, uh, you know, when I belong to another party, I don't owe it to you. So, but again, I, I'm, as, as I said, I'm not justifying because I'm not private. But whatever the case is, I think we need the Kenyans of uh, goodwill. Mm -hmm. uh, it's time, as Mwishimwa Pogisho is saying, that we heal this country. We need a national conversation and dialogue. And a lot of that's happening on the background. So we need people like that who are moderate to come to the table and bring the country together. All right. Uh, let's hear from uh, David McCalley. Are you on that uh, demilitarized zone in the middle? Yeah. I'm not in the no man's <laughs> land. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not easy to belong to that place that, uh, uh, you know, Shem is talking about. You know, eventually you find that you have no audience, you have no traction, because people want action in politics to move. If you're just there, you're not creating, you're not moving, you're not, you're not likely to be um, an important center. You drift into irrelevance. And um, the call that he's uh, calling, you know, uh, middle ground is a very tenuous morphous space. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that, uh, for example, the Third Way Alliance of the Kuru Court tried to be the sober people pushing issue politics. They didn't go places. So this country has been, uh, you know, attuned to um, um, uh, hot-headed politics and drive. If you can't do that, you know, <laughs> you you are not in the marketplace. And uh, but that is not to say that uh, you know to support. Uh, you know, uh, extremist politics or anything, but it is to say that leadership demands that you make decisions, and some of them might be very uncomfortable decisions even to yourself, and that is where it came, to, you know, to the people who went to uh, uh, Uhuru Park and those who didn't go. Even those who didn't go had to make very serious decisions to remain, uh, you know, and those who went had to make very serious, it was a very serious decision. But I, I am on the side of, I, I would fault the ones who didn't go for this reason. The countdown to January 30th had been with their full participation. Their flock had come all the way from all the other parts of the country. We reported, we followed them getting into buses. They were reported to be on the way to Nairobi. And you were in Nairobi waiting. What did you expect them to do? Come to Uhuru Park and then fail to show up? I mean, that is now deserting a flock. And that's why I have a problem with it. If they had said, we don't think this thing is right, it's an illegal thing we want to do, then on Monday, they preempted the meeting on Tuesday by actually declaring their unwillingness to attend. Rather than allow people to gather at Uhuru Park, then you are in a hotel making calls and saying, no, 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 we can't go there. You're going to create even a security issue with those people. Suppose they decided to riot. You would take la responsibility for their conduct mm -hmm. so, so, as, 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 as long as they've arrived there. So there are a bit of issues about the, your conduct and how it can be misleading. They say, they say, say no when you mean no. Don't say no when you mean yes. And that seems to have been the case with uh, the no-shows. <laughs> <laughs> a right of reply. <laughs> right uh, very of briefly, reply. We, we move yeah. on to... Uh, the, the uh, th there's been talk of people talking of, are you non-partisan or are you, are, are, you, are you neutral? I think these are two terms that are different that we must recognize. When one says that we are in the middle, we're not saying we are neutral. We are basically saying that we need people to be partisan. When Jubilee does something that's good, uh, please call it by its name. When NASA does, does something that's good, also call it by its name. But you know the guys uh, that are failing to be in the middle are that whether NASA does that's something that's good or right, you, are, you have to go by the current. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what we're talking about. But also I wanted just to alert uh, my brother David here. When, because I was at the heart of conception and formation of NAC. We were called all on manner of names. People said this one. In fact, even a very senior, late senior minister said, ah, that thing of Kinochoda and Wamalwa, they're just teaching Mandazi. The opposition will never unite. I want to give confidence that uh, this middle ground will turn into something someday soon. For me, the critical thing is how do we recreate 
202 in the year 2022. And I'd want to encourage those who are level-headed on both sides. It's time that we come. The Bible also says, let's come together and reason. All right, thank you. All right, let's uh, now uh, flip over to page uh, five of a daily nation. Cabinet appointees ordered to relinquish political parties' roles. That is what we have there. Politicians appointed as chief administrative secretaries have been ordered to relinquish, relinquish their roles in parties. Some officers start work today with reports that their appointments have sent administrators in ministries scrambling to get them offices and cars. And of course, they went to, through the vetting. And we have also uh, a snippet there of how uh, submit views by tomorrow. The deadline for the submission of memoranda on 10 nominees for principal secretary, eight for ambassadors, and three for the Judicial Service Commission is tomorrow. The memo should be in form of sworn affidavits. After the deadline, Parliament will announce the dates on which the nominees will meet departmental committees for the public interviews, more commonly known as vetting. Right, let's, let's just drill deep and we look at the swearing in as well. Some, as I mentioned, uh, dockets have been moved and uh, we want to see the rhyme and reason why these particular do dockets have been moved. Uh, we can try and pick up the Ministry of Lands, first of all, that uh, we know, uh, as we mentioned, housing also was domicile in this particular ministry. Now that it has been moved to transport and it seems transport is really uh, saddled with so many dockets right now, if we may look at it. And we want to ask ourselves why. First of all, now it has a new docket of housing. Uh, and uh, urban planning as well is under transport as well. And uh, we can see the constitution of uh, the committees as well that has been also very, uh, very, very, very controversial within transport itself. Maybe we can start by looking at your own overview of uh, the swearing in and the ministers that are incoming. Are you happy that, yes, some of these dockets have been moved from, we know also from water Irrigation has been separated from water. It's gone to agriculture as well. Let's begin with you. Uh, well, um, I agree with the Senator Pogisio when he says that uh, since uh, these are appointees of Uhuru's uh, government, mm -hmm. or these are cabinet appointees of Uhuru, yes. he's got a right to jig them. He's more or less like a football club manager. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes as a spectator on the sidelines, you can watch the actions of a football club manager. Those of us who support uh, Arsenal, uh, we, we have become experts in uh, pointing out his mistakes. And again, li in, in likely manner, Uhuru Kenyatta, by uh, you know, uh, amalgamating too many functions in one ministry, yes. he might find himself in a situation where he has a striker uh, whom he has also given a defense role or a midfielder whom he has given a goalkeeping role. Yes. So that would uh, hinder the effectiveness of uh, that particular player. But uh, be as it may, we know that there are limitations on the number of people that could be appointed to the cabinet. Uh, just uh, uh, yesterday, uh, Senator Pogisi and I were in a meeting and we were querying the role of this new kid on the block called CAS. I think it's called uh, Chief uh, Administrative Secretary which is a backdoor introduction of the assistant minister role. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so we, we are waiting to see um, how that will be achieved. On the issues of uh, CS nominees relinquishing political positions, I'm a bit worried because Rafael Tuju is the Secretary General of, uh, of, 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 of Jubilee and uh, he's got a ghost worker kind of status within the cabinet where he's a cabinet secretary without portfolio. So I'm not sure whether the president is very genuine when he says he wants to delink the cabinet from, uh, from, from political party roles, yet uh, his secretary general is sitting in there. My reading of this cabinet, and a lot of people have been talking about uh, Uhuru Kenyatta wanting to leave a legacy. And uh, of recent, we've been uh, told about the big four mm -hmm. around manufacturing, around health, around food security, and uh, I, I think there's a fourth, uh, and, and affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Deb Debal, I can tell you that the last four years of Uhuru's presidency have been wasted. He has not laid the foundation that is sufficient for him to achieve the big four. If you look at healthcare, for example, a lot is being said about the managed equipment scheme. Just the other day, the National Assembly Health Committee came up with a report that said that the managed equipment scheme is not meeting uh, its, its, its targets. Uh, I think two weeks ago, it was World Cancer Day, and we are talking about issues of cancer. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. that we are able to, to do diagnosis in certain counties. In certain counties, we cannot because we do not, we do not have the, the human resource. Mm -hmm. So we have not laid the bed for us to achieve that uh, affordable and universal healthcare. If you look at manufacturing, we've been talking about connection of people to the mm -hmm. electricity grid, which has happened in a very lopsided manner. Well, if you came to my county of Homabay, and particularly my home village, just right now there's a live conversation going on. For the poor people in Homabay County to connect to the electricity grid, even when you are 500 meters away from a primary school, mm -hmm. you have to pay almost 170,000 shillings for, for a connection. Yet in certain parts of the country, it is 15,000. We talked of the 5,000 megawatts in the last four and a half years, mm -hmm. which was not achieved. Right now in my county, there is a 40 megawatt solar plant in uh, Karachonyo constituency, which has not been fed into the national grid because of bureaucracies within the ERC. So for you to achieve manufacturing, you have to look at power, and we know what's going on right now with issues of tariffs and billings from KPLC. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to say is that it is not just about the personalities, but what is the framework, what is the environment, what is the foundation in which these people are coming in. I'm afraid that these cabinet secretaries, they will be required to work extra hard. They will have to work 26 hours in a day for them to be able to achieve the big four. Because the four and a half years and the cabinet secretaries of the past, due to politics and due to the concern about re-election, did not lay the right foundation. All right, let's hear from Pogesio. Well, I, I, again, uh, Dival, the, we, we, we needed at some point during the process of uh, constitution making to have defined the ministries. And I think we didn't do that. We missed out on, on that. Otherwise, it will be fluid. From time to time, I think the president has a right as I said, to look at you or Kajuang and say, this man can carry so much, let's give it to him. And those who can't carry so much, <laughs> you give them a lighter load. And I think that's why they keep shifting things around. Um, uh, I, I think also on the issue of, um, uh, um, the, on the issue of uh, housing, it's been back and forth. I don't think it's been in land throughout. It has also been back in transport and, and then for back and forth. So I, I do believe that uh, in a way, uh, they will keep balancing until they find um, a, a place where they will carry this load properly. But uh, we, when we look at transport as well, uh, the, the sort of uh, allocation of money that will go to transport as well, uh, looking at the SGR, what is happening right now, and generally the outlook of infrastructure in the country, don't you think this particular docket will hold a lot of monies? Because I'm given to understand as well that the World Bank will be working in partnership uh, of course, uh, with counties to roll out, you know, to help with the housing development in this country. That will be rolled out within counties. It's, yeah. a, hu it's a huge ministry. It is it's actually a very, very big unit. In fact, the number of uh, parastatums under that ministry is so, so, so big. So that's what we're saying. That and it uh, doesn't make any lick of sense to actually to add another docket on the transport. Well, uh, that, that we all know that. But, uh, you know, we're saying uh, the big four um, agenda items on, on, on the president, he probably wants to play them out in a different manner. Um, but, but putting putting all the resources in one ministry uh, is is something else. But I think that we we have said here that our, our role is to oversight <coughs> as members of parliament to look at how that plays out now into equity, into equal distribution of resources, and um, <coughs> you know fairness. So we we want to agree that uh, it's the president's uh, cabinet. Let him organize it the way he wants to organize it. Um, we don't even have uh, uh, public participation mm -hmm. in deciding these things. So we can only do f wishful thinking here. <laughs> you and I can only do that. I wish there was a system of public participation. And, and, and you know, when, when we, without, without really criticizing my own colleagues, when it came to vetting uh, this cabinet things, we, they were, they were not, they were, these issues didn't rise up. No, these issues were not raised. Um, and, and even the, 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 the capacity of the people themselves was not raised. So because, because of the manner in which we vet these people, it's like we passed the whole thing through, and so it's up to now the executive to organize themselves the way they want. We will definitely have a hard time uh, you know, dealing with one ministry with so many uh, uh, parastatals, so, so many uh, uh, dockets mm -hmm. within one. It, it's not going to be easy to run. But, um, but but that's up to that's not really up to the, the executive, and right. I think that that's going to come up right. during the 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 term 
and, and it's going to come up in, in the way that we uh, oversight these people. All right, the president has been very categorical that he's going to be a business unusual. But in light of that, uh, isn't he actually uh, double speaking or speaking from both sides of his mouth? Because you can see a, a regurgitation of the same, same uh, you know, uh, ministers, some of them who are sent home because of issues of corruption, again, being assigned some dockets. Uh, for instance, we can have uh, Felix Koske in the Judicial Service Commission as well. We know he was embroiled, or, uh, of course, in some sort of corruption, and that's why, that's why he was shown the door. But yet he's been given an assignment as well. Uh, when we're talking about it will be business unusual, unusual. And yet we still have the same people and faces who are doing the business as, as usual. Uh, right. Don't you think this is uh, sort of uh, disjointed? Uh, the bulk for me, I, I buy that idea that the prerogative of the president, uh, how he structures his uh, government and cabinet especially, uh, it could be a sign of confidence uh, that in some ministers he knows they can deliver. And I think, I think to be fair to Honorable Machari, I think he's done a fairly reasonable job. Uh, there are people that he's uh, of, uh, uh, giving assignments, like Dr. Matiangi. I, I think uh, I, I can vote for him for the work he did in education. I'm not too sure I can do that for the other sectors, but uh, yes. So, but it's, it's the prerogative of the president to how he structures his cabinet. But having said that, uh, while uh, Mwishimua Pogisho doesn't want to be seen to blame his colleagues, I think it's, it's incumbent upon Parliament, and maybe Honorable Kajuan can tell us, the justification he, they had as NASA for having uh, uh, given a wide berth to the vetting. Because some of the things that are being said here, they needed, they have, for me, for example, coming from Homa Bay County, I wanted my voice heard there. Uh, but uh, now that uh, they they didn't do that, uh, that's why we are blaming. Uh, we, we while we have a platform that's uh, that we are given the people rightly or wrongly that we could use to vet uh, these uh, cabinet members. Uh, but also, I think the issues of um, we seem to have taken it because in future people may say this presidents. I still don't understand why the old members, the CSS, were not vetted. I mean, which law? Uh, are we utilizing? Uh, I think nobody is, is taking that up. And again, it's incumbent upon the members of parliament to have brought that out on both sides of the divide that, look, even those who were in the previous administrations bring them forward. In the case of my good friend, uh, Honorable Raphael Tuju, I'm not too sure. I didn't see him being sworn in. I didn't see him being vetted. So I really don't know. Uh, is he in or is he out? I mean, it's vital that, again, parliamentarians are the people who should have raised uh, these issues. Then the aspect of this CS, uh, uh, again, the Constitution is very clear. Uh, uh, the, the, the PSS are the chief administrative officers uh, in, in, of the respective ministries. How does this fit the CS, uh, CSS? I didn't hear parliament question, query. So to this extent, I think really the blame, I wouldn't put it so much on the executive as I would on the legislature. Right, let's hear from David Makali. Well, I think there are heavy issues around uh, cabinet uh, <coughs> appointments and deployments uh, of the responsibilities. Uh, you know, for us going forward, I mean, that has already happened and we are waiting for the executive order of alignment of cabinet portfolios, um, including you know issues which may not be apparent in the big title when you see infrastructure, housing, and whatnot. We need now to look underneath when the president eventually gives out his uh, descriptions of what each ministry will be carrying out the responsibilities. But you know, looking in from outside, as uh, Honorable Kajuang said, you know, from the bench, uh, you know, you, you can read a lot in terms of uh, you know the philosophy and intentions that are coming out of the president's uh, uh, appointments. First is the concentration of certain responsibilities in certain ministries and individuals. Mm -hmm. So for us, we should be trusting, we, 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 the, the cut will be out of the bag when the cabinet, uh, when, when rather, when, when the budget eventually is released. Because where is the money going to be? Who is going to be uh, allocated how much? And as we've been talking about here, the ministry that uh, you know, Masharia is responsible for, the you know, infrastructure and all that with housing, and could actually almost take you know, 30 percent of our budget if we don't, uh, mm -hmm. um, if, if we, we we don't check, as well as the other ministries. Uh, we've created super ministries. There's not going to be equality of ministries. Take it or leave it. When this thing eventually comes out, 
you will have very light ministry like Ministry of Labor <laughs> with a budget that can, uh, you know, basically be lightweight and huge ministries like agriculture, uh, which is going to control all the irrigation budgets and so forth. So the, for the public, I think we need to follow the, tr the money. Uh, where is the money going? And why is it going in those particular ministries? And who is going to be responsible uh, for the management of those resources? Let me just repeat what we said here from the beginning. The appointment of, of chief administrative secretaries still stinks. The matter is in court, of course, on Tata, our litigant general has gone to court <laughs> to represent the public, uh, to express its outrage. But suffice to say that the president invoked Article 132 of the Constitution, uh, I think 132.4, which allows him in consultation with the public service to create positions in the public service. But the matter is it's not the creation of the positions, it is the filling of those positions. How do you have the principal secretaries and ministries vetted, as is going to happen this week, and you have the cabinet secretaries vetted, but you have some animal called CAS in here who is not vetted but is unilaterally appointed and is sitting in the public service? That is a question that even the planners and the policy makers who ended up with that decision have yet to explain to the public. And yet they're going to be paid from the public pass. So that is a matter that I think the president needs to clean up. And then I have to fault the courts. You know, even as we talk about uh, enforcement of uh, court orders, yes. the inconsistencies from the courts are also very, very stro uh, uh, striking. What is the power? Or, I mean, how are the courts using the injunctive power to preempt and to uh, uphold certain things? We have seen people go to court say, look, this should not go ahead pending the hearing of this matter. In the case of this particular CS, the court said we'll have the hearing and the people are occupying office. So look at the cost of the, <laughs> yes. the chief, secre chief administrative secretary Secretary's taking yes. up office. How will the court then reverse that when facilities, infrastructure is being created to host them? Yet I've seen matters where the court say, no, no, don't proceed until the matter is heard. What was the difficulty here? And so we are seeing a lot of inconsistency within the courts, which also I think, without uh, supporting Rafael Tuju, uh, we must raise uh, <laughs> I, I, they raise eyebrows. So he's not, he was not sworn in, uh, he didn't take any oath, so how are we going to no, hold him Tuju, accountable? I yeah? think the explanation also about Tuju is a bit, uh, it's, it's tricky. I Briefly, think as we're winding up, yeah. It is, it is the issue that the, the Tuju brings in the hand of the party in the implementation of the manifesto. So they have explained that he is not a cabinet secretary, but he's sort of an adjunct member of the cabinet who comes <laughs> <in>. <laughs> Who a, <laughs> a part time <laughs> member of the cabinet who comes in when they are discussing the enforcement of the manifesto and how the cabinet, how the government is proceeding, and then goes out when they have finished that business. So he doesn't have to be sworn in because he's not a full cabinet secretary. So he's a roving CS. <laughs> so today he will be whatever ministry he chooses to. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the one, <laughs> let, let me just respond quick, very, just a minute we, to we a challenge. We actually by, for time. Yeah, but, but by shame. Shame. Why didn't the opposition participate in the vetting? And uh, Shem, you, you answered it. When Jubilee decided that uh, existing cabinet secretaries were not going to be vetted, when Jubilee decided that CASs were going to be appointed without the intervention of parliament, we realized that this was a rigged process and we decided there is no value that we are going to add by being part of it. But finally, the injunctive power of the judiciary over legislative proceedings is a matter that uh, received some consideration, I think, three, four Thank weeks you. ago. And I think it has been settled. Uh, I don't know whether it's a matter, it's, it's been appealed, but there was some consideration on that matter by, by the courts. Right, thank you. Thank you. you no, 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 no. We, we're actually closing at 30 seconds, uh, Pogesho, uh, just your closing remarks. Yeah, I, I, I want us to also know that we need to strengthen uh, the legislative process. Right now, we're not <coughs> able to function properly as a unit, as a house, again, because, because uh, the, the, the opposition side or the other side of the house is not participating uh, for whatever principal reasons they have, whatever reasons they have, so it makes it difficult for us actually to speak with one voice. Thank and you. Uh, Thank you. Shem, 30 uh, seconds. Uh, I think it's not sufficient reason. The fact that Jubilee deciding that they're not going to vet certain officers, I thought that's why Parliament is there. At least your voice will have been heard. I know opposition would say we're in a minority. But you remember the days of the seven bearded sisters? At least Kenyans knew that you did raise your flag on this matter. So Thank really, you. really, I can't buy that Thank explanation. Thank you. David Makali. 30 seconds. I think, no, I've said enough. You've said enough. Thank you. <laughs> we need it on that note. Thank you also for 
your valuable input uh, this morning as well. We're stuck for time. It is eight on the nose. And I thank you also as well for, I can see the rush of tweets. Uh, cannot be able to read all of them. But thank you nonetheless for share, sharing and uh, your contribution as well this morning. Thank you for your valid company. I'm Dibala Have a lovely day.